got married, hasn't he? Oh. <laughs> well done, David. Good to Kevin Sinfield. Not to Kevin Sinfield, is it, Dave? No, it's not. No, no. Congratulations, lad. Thank you. <laughs> Kath, are there many waiting to come in? No, I think there's one more person just coming in now, David Taylor. This is the, the lowest attendance we've had so far. There may be others turning up yet. Yeah, it is. Usually we're maxed out by now, aren't we? We are, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll give it a couple of more moments till just in case. Graham's arrived, but he doesn't know how to put his video on, I don't think. We've just got GRA again. Yeah. Who's <laughs> hey, complaining again, Brian Hopwood? What? Hey? What are you saying about me? <laughs> if you want to sort your vision out, you're just a GRAHA at the moment, as you have been every time we've been on this thing. Very incognito. <laughs> Could, could I ask you, therefore, everybody, if you'd uh, just mute you. your microphone so that we don't get any background disturbance, people coming in, telephones ringing and dogs barking and so on and so on, um, unless you want to speak. Uh, and if you <laughs> raise your hand or uh, mine's currently covering three screens, so obviously I won't be able to see everybody. If you want to speak, if you just... Uh, Pick the appropriate moment, raise your hand if you can, or send me a chat message so that I can know that you want to say something, if, it, if it's appropriate. So I'll do a proper introduction now. Good evening and, and welcome to everybody. I've lost count now. We must have done five or six of, <coughs> excuse me, five or six of these open forums now. Uh, and normally we get about 100 people watching on the evening. We've got quite a, a long agenda this evening with, with seven different sections to it. Uh, I do want to put a guillotine on though for 8.30. So if we're still talking at 8.30, I will be looking to wind it up at that time. I think an hour and a half uh, sitting in front of your computer on a Thursday evening is long enough for anybody, wherever you are and whatever you're doing. Um, so uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to start off. That, that's the introduction. Um, most of you, well, all of you, I hope, will be aware that this coming weekend we have our... Thomas event, the first sold out event since Halloween last year, basically. We had a big event with the Diesel Gala a, a month or two back, but this is the, the second event and it's, it is a total sellout. There are no tickets available and no tickets available on the day. And uh, so we, we are going to be very busy. We are drastically short of help, though I must say at the moment, I've got only two or three people who said that they're willing to be stewards in the carriages. And um, we are very short of people working in the buffets, both on platform three and four, and especially in the buffet in the carriage. It's going to be in Castlecroft, uh, hopefully from tomorrow. I don't know whether Sean uh, Lee's here tonight. Uh, we, we've got a carriage going into Castlecroft to replace the cafe coach that used to be there. And uh, that will be there for the weekend. And we, we, we do need some volunteers to help serve refreshments in there as well as the, the stewards and meeting and greeting and sales points. There's lots of different jobs that need doing. If anybody can help even for half a day, uh, Sunday, Saturday or Sunday, please get in touch with myself or Lorna. Lorna Massey is the new uh, events manager. I think she's got a broader descript job description than just events, but uh, uh, for this weekend, she's in charge of the events. And so anybody who can help would be, would be very grateful if they could, um, get in touch with her or myself so that we can build you into the staffing roster that we've got. Um, this is a rather strange request, but uh, most of you will have at some time been into what's called the Activity <coughs> Centre or the FXP hut, which is alongside Trackside. During the last three or four, five, six months, two of the tables have been borrowed from there. And despite me asking everybody I meet, nobody seems to know where they've gone to. Two very nice brown tables have gone missing. If you've got them in your department and you don't think that they're yours, please let me know because we need them back for various functions. They've been temporarily replaced by a trestle table, which isn't convenient at all. So if you've got two brown tables with um, T-shaped legs 
uh, at either end, then please let me know because we do need them back. And uh, finally, uh, you all will be aware that I am chairman of the Volunteer Champions Group, which meets pretty regularly to discuss matters with the management and um, exchange information and ideas backwards and forwards. Um, we have recently decided to increase the size of the group so that we can have more people involved and represent more areas of the railway. So there are vacancies on the champions. If anybody is interested and feels that they might be able to contribute with ideas, thoughts, comments, and um, basically listen to what management have to say about the running of the railway on, on an occasional basis, then please get in touch with me uh, and I can give you more information and, and tell you what is involved. It's basically meeting the working members. That's what we're, we're there to do. We have to, we're out there to go and talk to people and, and find out what they think about the railway and what ideas they've got and so on. But we have got extra vacancies now because we've increased the size and the membership is based on first come first served at the moment. Anybody who wants to join will be able to join straight away because we have got vacancies. But we do have a, normally have a running list of, uh, of vacancies and people who, applicants who want to join. Uh, so, um, I think we can move on now. Uh, Mike, do you want me to start off with the video and then you yeah. speak afterwards? Uh, okay? Yeah, just, uh, uh, just a bit of fun. I thought uh, this little short video together to open up the meeting and get us underwear. Thanks, Mike. Hopefully you can all see my second screen. I don't see it yet, Mike. You can't. All aboard. I can hear it though. Oh, there we go. Thanks, everybody. Uh, it's perhaps just a reminder that what we've come through and what we've all experienced, both on the railway and off the railway, in our, or in our own circumstances, and how important and precious the railway is to lots of people, uh, including people Hi, on this Michael, session Jenner, tonight. Uh, and Hello, and I'm here today at the track. Sorry. YouTube carry on playing. I do apologize, oh. Mike. It's all right. Yeah, so just a reminder that we're here. Uh, I think hopefully we'll get a good summer and autumn and winter season out of the way, which will springboard us into 2022. So a little bit of fun there. We'll, we'll put that on the, the YouTube through hops, etc. Um, I might have to read about this because uh, I want to get it right. But I just also want to announce tonight that... Uh, I'm introducing uh, a Chairman's Staff Long Service Award. Uh, no member of staff or volunteer comes to the railway and expects recognition for their time and skills to assist the railway, but it's always nice to be thanked. Uh, the LRPS, however, does recognise the efforts of volunteers with their own award scheme held annually at their AGM, which has been running for many years. I still consider myself a relatively new Chairman 
uh, and I feel it's time the company actually receives the benefits of free volunteer time and staff loyalty to now step forward and formally recognize the work of staff and volunteers with its own long service award scheme. The LR board at the meeting in June unanimously agreed to my proposal to go forward. Uh, I have to say it's always difficult to introduce a scheme when an organisation like the ELR uh, has been operating for so many years. And to overcome this, there's to be a one-off awards ceremony uh, to make retrospective awards in October. A date has been set now for the 20th of October for this one-off ceremony. Uh, there's almost 50 people who are entitled to an award. Uh, we're working with David uh, Wilson and Margaret Wilson for the record <laughs> to make sure we get that absolutely right. So those people who are uh, qualify for a retrospective award will be invited to this event along with their partners. From 2022, we are joining up the award scheme with the Preservation Society and we want to hold an honours day the closest Saturday, Sunday to the 25th of July, which is the famous day when the first train left from Bury to go to Ramsbottom. Uh, now, uh, what is it that we're, we're planning to hand over as an award? Specially commissioned plaques are being made as we speak uh, in Yorkshire. Unfortunately, I couldn't find a place in the United Uh so oh, for uh, 50 years, it'll be a gold pack. For 40 years, it'll be a silver pack. And for 30 years, it'll be a bronze pack. And if anybody survives to 60 years, we'll mint a special one, platinum. Okay. Uh, there's also uh, all those recipients who re receive a pack for those years will also get a, a badge. Also be badges for 10 years service. 20 years service and they've been specially commissioned as well. Now to receive an award um, we'll use the Preservation Society's records and my thanks to David and Margaret for helping us with that. Uh, I just hope we do get it right. If we haven't got it quite right people just need to refresh uh, their memory with the length of service they've got and please contact David or Margaret if you think it's wrong. Okay. Uh, I think that's uh, important. The other thing I felt and feel quite strongly about, and it's always a difficult call this, uh, is that a number of people retired in 2020 who were very, very much in line for an award and they fell short because they retired for whatever reason, and I'm not splitting hairs about that. A number of people will get awards who retired from 2020 onwards and who would have qualified. So uh, I think that's important. Uh, and finally, uh, people say, well, how can we afford it? Because we're skint. Well, all the costs, I mean, all the costs, I will pay for myself. I will also leave when I fall off my perch at some point, a trust fund uh, that will fund future annual awards. Uh, I think as far as that's concerned, uh, that's uh, what I wanted to announce tonight. All the details will be out on hops in the next day or so when I get myself sorted out. So uh, thanks everybody, uh, and hopefully, you know, together we can we can celebrate the fantastic work of staff and volunteers over the many years. Uh, and from 2022, we'll have a, a proper embedded wards system. Uh, jointly uh, uh, looked after by ourselves and the Preservation Society. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, Michael. That's 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 great. Um, I want to move on quickly. Uh, is Mark Hill with us this evening? I I can't see him on my screen. Here, Mark. Uh, yes, I am. Can you can you, you hear are. me and see me? I'm 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 reliant on the uh, office Wi-Fi here. Can you see me? Okay. Uh, we can. can you hear me? It's worrying that it says Sean Lee on my naming. That's uh, 
That's right, yes. Yeah. Sean, uh, we're sharing a connection um, oh, so okay. that we don't take up too many. Uh, so oh, you've definitely got the stutters, Mark. Your voice has got, you're on, sh you're on mute, Mark. Okay, can you hear me okay? That's fine now, if you want to do your presentation now. Okay, so uh, first of all, uh, um, can we talk about the website, if we may, and um, we started on this journey actually last year, um, and uh, thanks to some, I think, um, a Dawn Sexton at the Trust in helping us get the funding for this new website. Um, uh, much of the work has been done on it this year, and, and of course, just by is, is our shop window, and it was looking a little bit tired. Um, and uh, so we wanted to refresh it, but also um, promote the railway a bit more and the things that you can do, not just travel on the train, but also uh, places to stop off and suggestions on itineraries. So we've, we've um, this is very much stage one. It's launched. Um, we've had some really good feedback. Um, uh, just I've received some stats just before this meeting that we've got a 60% increase in visitor numbers, which is the proof in the pudding. Um, obviously, we, we've, we've had to make a few changes here and there uh, just to uh, ensure that we've got everything accurate on the website. Um, so I had a very good conversation with Bob Howarth this evening that and we found out that it's actually Google needs updating at Hayward. So we just need to make some changes on that. But uh, all very positive uh, and um, we have a few changes outstanding. So we're just working through those. Um, the really good thing also about this website is more than one of us have been um, trained up on how to use it. So it's not just all down to the marketing function. Uh, there's a number of us that can update the website uh, moving forward. So, but any suggestions, please do forward them on to us because uh, this is stage one. We're looking at uh, do to, to uh, take it, enhance it uh, in further steps. Okay, so that's the website. Um, if I may, Mike, move on to the questions, because I received some questions from uh, Graham Law um, and also from Bob Howarth. Um, I've actually spoken both to Graham and to Bob prior to this meeting, but there were some questions about um, uh, the Thomas event and why everything's uh, quite very centric, if you like. Um, and just to reassure people, we're not trying to cut stations out, but to get these uh, tickets on sale for, for Thomas, uh, we had to redesign the event so that if, say, we still had restrictions, that the event could, we, we had the best chance of running the event. Um, so this year, uh, it's very, very centric. Um, people board Thomas, they get a Ram's Bottom, then they come back, and then there's other activities that take place. Uh, there are other train services as well. We have, uh, we have sold out, as you said, Mike. Um, there is a special fares notice that's gone out this afternoon. We've been working with Gerald on that. Uh, so there won't be any, officially, there won't be any tickets available on the day uh, for ordinary fares. Um, and uh, we will be marking the event as sold out uh, tomorrow on our website. And just to uh, say to people that please don't come along on the day because we won't be offering any tickets on the day. Um, there will be an email going out to consumers tomorrow as well to just make them aware of the other activities and also the train timetable. So not just the Thomas train that, they can, that they're reserved on, but also the additional trains. So if they want a longer journey out and back to Rottenstall or, or, or up to Haywood, or in fact, starting from, from Haywood. Okay, uh, so just to also, I've spoken to Bob Howarth uh, this evening as well to talk about um, uh, some of the things that he, he's raised. Um, so uh, I know that Lorna's is working with him on that terms of some of the, the decoration of the stations. One question came in about why isn't Flying Scotsman going to Hayward? Um, we've actually redesigned the timetable to try and maximise the travel trade business that was coming in. So just to give you an example, we were doing about 45, 50,000 pounds in travel trade business. Um, but the travel trade industry aren't interested 
really in a 15 minute trip to Haywood. They're more interested in a slightly longer trip. So that's why we redesigned the timetable for that. And that's actually resulted in um, uh, about 90,000 pounds in travel trade revenue to date. Um, so that's the reason why we weren't trying to exclude Haywood. Um, the, the, we will be uh, announcing shortly uh, that there will be additional trains running. So if you're a flying Scotsman ticket holder, you can go to Haywood or you can start your journey from Haywood uh, or from Rottenstall or, in fact, any of the other stations as advertised. So we'll get that timetable published. And anyone that's got a flying Scotsman timetable, a flying Scotsman ticket will uh, receive an email um, uh, so that they're aware of those additional trains. Um, there are some issues specifically to do with how we've got Haywood listed on the website uh, and I've just been working through those with Bob uh, as it stands. One of the things to make you aware of is, is hearing loud and clear about st the station masters <coughs> want to be included a bit more with the um, uh, future events and we're going to have a, a catch up perhaps in September to just talk about that and how we make the events more interesting uh, at the other stations. Okay so um, I think that answers all those questions hopefully all being well. Uh, there was one question we probably could cover while you're there about resident permits. Are they still viable during Thomas? Uh, no, we, we, we've made a decision not to uh, allow resident permits to travel on our train. So it's a, basically it's event ticket holders only, advanced ticket holders only. As, and the special fares notice has gone out uh, this afternoon. Fine. OK, thanks. Uh, Mike Kelly's got his hand yeah. up. Mike? Um, Mark, can you just announce what's happening on the two static days at Harewood? Can you just announce what's happening at Harewood? Oh, yes, yes, sorry, I forgot to mention Scotsman. that. Yes, yeah, of course. Uh, the Tuesday, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday after the bank holiday Monday, <laughs> we're, we've got Flying Scotsman on static display at Haywood. Um, and uh, so we are, we're, we're just building that event so that we can put them on sale. Um, sorry, I completely forgot to mention that. Um, and uh, so that will be the Tuesday and the Wednesday after the bank holiday Monday. Fine. Thanks very much, Mark. Um, I'm getting no other indications of questions for yourself, so I'd like to move on. Um, we've got uh, Tracy, if you're ready to give us a general business progress report, that would be very helpful. I will share my screen, Trace, for you. Me. Good evening, everyone. I hope you're fitting well. Um, I'm going to give you a general business update, but basically, um, I I'm well, going to say a massive thank you. Tracy, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Kath, can you share the screen if I. Oh, yes, you can. Oh, that's Yay. great. I do apologise. Yes, you can. <laughs> Fine. Carry on, Trace. I'm sorry. It's all right. Don't worry. Yeah. Um, Basically, I've got a massive thank you to say to absolutely everybody for their contributions. I'm massively proud of people's contributions over the last 18 months. It's been very difficult. We've come and kept in touch with each other and come through it. We're now in the recovery stage. We're a long way from being um, where we should be. However, we have made a massive strides forward and I have to say it, I am massively proud of everybody's contribution whether you've been working on competencies policy documents whether you've been fundraising everybody's contribution has made us where we are today so massively proud of you and thank you very much indeed right so we are in recovery um, we've got a fair way to go because I think it's put us back probably about five years however uh, COVID-19 easements have allowed us to uh, recommence doing events. Um, but also there is an element of caution that I would like to say with everybody, and that is it's not over. COVID-19 is not over. So we've got to look after each other. Keep sticking the lateral flow tests up your nose and wherever else you want to stick them. Um, just to look after each other, to make sure that we are not, you know, spreading when we, we, we really we're all friends together. So it's uh, massively important that we look after each other. But um, the start of events, Thomas, wow, it's been a monumental effort here in trying to put this together in a different format that Mattel would actually agree to that allowed us the flexibility with or without restrictions. So 
Um, the numbers will be smaller, but it is a sellout. So it's encouraging. Um, we'll see how it goes and we'll learn lots and lots and lots this weekend. But if you can assist, we would absolutely love to see you. Um, one thing that we are going through is a careful review of all business activities to make sure that they're paying the way. And that means everything across the board, whether it be uh, turn up and pay on the day, how we do tickets, um, all activities, all events, all business areas. Are they actually making us money? And if they're not, we've got to look at them carefully to make sure that we can actually turn them around so they are or do something different. So that's a, a, a great concentration of focus at the moment. Also, the control of expenditure. Uh, Kath has been absolutely brilliant of saying no to people who wanted to spend anything with a smile on her face. We're now in a, a much more, um, well, we, we, we feel much more in a, a positive position, but she's still saying no. So the control of expenditure is still critical. And also, we're also looking for alternative sources of income all the time, whether that be filming, whether that be a Linsinger have brought their second magic machine to do some real milling. Not only does it help us with the real milling, but um, that's commissioning work that's actually just pays directly into the bank for us, which is great. The biggest risks to us over the next... I would say probably five to 10 years are people. And I mean by that recruitment, retention, and making sure that we look after each other's welfare because the volunteering sector is really the, the dynamics of people's household incomes change, how we work, when we retire, how much time we've got available has all changed. And I think it's, it's sharp focus that we've now got a working group through the volunteer champions that's absolutely looking at how we bring people into and retain them. We want everybody who was sat around the table at that meeting um, on Monday focused on what volunteering meant to them. And the predominant items that came out were camaraderie and purpose. And I think that's, that's a really good starting focal point for bringing new people into volunteering and what it can actually bring to their life. So there's a strong focus on this. It is critical that we get this right for the next five to 10 years for our future sustainability. Moving on, the next important bit is the kit to make sure that we can still keep the wheels turning. So that's rolling stock, traction, rail, undergrowth the whole lot the kit is it, it's vital as well as the people to make us able to run and i think there's been a, a good strong focus on on looking at areas and actually how we've managed those areas in the last few months so i think that's a, a positive step we've got a long way to go but actually gradually allowing us to do overhaul of coaches the repaints getting everything up to what we want to be as a world-class visitor attraction. And finally, competencies. It's, it's been appreciated that we've had quite a bit of time off and everybody needs a refresh before they come back. Certainly, uh, I don't know about anybody else, but if you're booking office, if I hadn't been using my math skills in the booking office, you won't be able to do the Sudoku puzzle. So it's just keeping that all going. And thank you to everybody who's actually taking the re-exams and the recertification to make sure that they're up to speed for, for delivering what we need to do for the general public. So in terms of where we are in, in finance, I'll hand over to Kath, but we're in a much more positive position than we were six months ago. So I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that we have in any way, shape or form taken our foot off the gas because I think everything is in sharp focus. But Kath has been critical in the finance management and I'll hand over to Kath for the numbers. <laughs> Thanks, Tracy. Right. Um, so, yeah, um, things are looking a little more positive. We do have to be very careful um, going projecting forward to 2022. Um, but we'll start off by looking at the positivity, the grants. So we've since the start of the pandemic, we've had £1.3 million in grants. Um, and thanks goes to everyone that's helped to um, get that money in. 
um, in particular Darn Sexton at the Trust um, for putting all the nice wordy stuff in. Um, the search for additional grant, uh, relevant grants does continue. Uh, we are still looking out there. Uh, the latest Culture Recovery Fund round three, unfortunately, we're not eligible for, uh, but we are still looking to see what's available. Um, obviously, we're still taking advantage of the job retention scheme, although that is dwindling now. Um, so, so far since the start of the pandemic, we've um, received £692,000 from that. Um, <clears throat> Major donations that we've had since the start of uh, the pandemic, including the likes of the generous um, donation from the LRPS right at the start, um, through to assistance with the Ginty um, and Raffle, the Raffle site funds, uh, which is pure profit. Um, we've earned £294,000. Um, so grand total there is £2.3 million that we've received through um, the assistance of grants government retention scheme and um, don like significant donations. Um, so that's brilliant, really good, really positive. Um, debt, debt and loans. So I think Stephen Holt uh, mentioned a question about um, uh, debt on the railway. Um, so currently we have two loans. Um, in 2019, at the end of 2019, we had the, uh, the City of Wales loan a balance of 240,000. Um, at the end of, uh, at currently at this point in time, we have two loans. Um, the Sybil's loan, which you have to take out um, as did many other um, businesses and charities to be able to survive through the COVID um, economic crisis, um, which we took out 400,000. We have now started to pay that back. Uh, recently, so um, that uh, currently stands at 387,000 and we still have the City of Wales loan. Um, we took a six month payment holiday throughout the um, pandemic uh, so that we could manage our cash. Um, so that now stands at 181,000. The City of loan, Wales loan now is due to end in, uh, I think, June 20, 2024 because we took the six month payment holiday. Uh, and the Sybil's loan will be due to be paid off in June 2026. Um, so as far as debt goes, at this moment in time, uh, we have £567,000 in loans. Um, if we're looking at other liabilities uh, in our balance sheets, uh, the significant things are things like advanced bookings, intercompany transactions, trade and sundry creditors, and accruals, all of which, well, some of which have increased since 2019, some of which have dropped. So advanced bookings, as you can imagine, have gone up significantly because we haven't been able to honour some of those bookings as yet, although they are planned in for the future. Um, Intercompany transactions have gone up slightly. Sundry creditors have gone down um, significantly because we do have the cash at the minute to pay our suppliers. Uh, and accruals have gone down as well, again, because we're getting the... Um, hot on getting the invoices in we don't necessarily have to accrue them at the end of the month um, so overall yes our liabilities have gone up um, since 2019 but we're still significantly healthy uh, we do have fixed assets totaling 4.85 million um, obviously we don't want to lose any of those uh, otherwise we won't have a railway um, so as far as that's concerned things are difficult but positive going forward. Just looking beyond the end of 2021. So although we are um, currently uh, cash rich, we are very careful with that money because we need to ensure that it lasts us through to this time next year. Uh, we don't know what the winter is going to hold. Um, historically, January, February, March has always been our difficult months. And strangely enough, always June has as well um, because there is a uh, very few... Um, events, in fact, no events in, in June um, for actual cash flow inwards. Um, so um, <clears throat> although we're not cash rich, uh, we do need to, do, although we are cash rich at the minute, we need to be conscious that we might not be by the end, by the winter time, and we need to make sure that that lasts us um, so, um, we're, so that we're okay for this time next year and we'll still be around. Uh, I've already addressed the repayment of the loans, um, so at the moment we have £567,000 worth. Um, we do need to recoup the losses that we made 
in 2020. Um, so far in 2021, uh, we are making a small surplus um, that may or may not uh, remain depending on what happens events wise. Um, if we can do what we plan to do, then great, we'll be um, on the straight and narrow, um, but we just can't predict at this moment in time. Um, as Tracy mentioned, I have been very nasty and strict with regards to saying no to uh, people spending money. Um, thank you to everyone who saved money and um, looked for the best way to, to um, get the best prices that we could for things we did need to spend money on. I totally understand that we cannot cost, cost any further. We are at the point where, you know, we need to continue doing what we're doing, but we can't go any further. Uh, just continue with the current cost savings for the time being until we know we can um, be on, back on the straight and narrow. Uh, we are, as I mentioned before, continuing to apply for grants where, where, where they're available. Uh, and if anyone does know of any, um, that's, um, uh, please let me know, uh, send me an email, drop me a line somehow, uh, just in case it's one that I have missed for any reason. Um, and lastly, um, we have to be conscious also, next year particularly, but also going forward, is the build, building up of reserves to make sure that we can maintain our assets. So our infrastructure, our traction and rolling stock, um, excuse me. <clears throat> um, so for next year, we have planned City of Wales overhaul. Now, initially that will be, well, it will be a total of £100,000. We may be able to defer a little bit of that, but we need to make sure we have that cash ready to be able to fund it. Um, we have the issue with uh, coaches needing to be retired. Um, by In 2022, we're planning to spend £22,000 22, on that. Um, and also tra plan track maintenance. Um, Richard has been very diligent in planning now uh, for the next few years of where needs to be prioritised for track maintenance going forward. Um, and we've been in discussions regarding that. Um, so we need to keep aside £50,000 for that in 2022, and that'll be very similar going forward in future years. Um, we also need to be conscious that in the uncertain economic times at the moment, um, that we have enough money to cover our costs um, uh, on, a, on a monthly basis. So we just need to make sure, or I need to make sure that we can have a, a build-up of reserves by the end of the year that will um, be available for us to use for those key areas in 2022. And then we'll go through the same process for 2023 and so on and so on. Um, the last thing I just wanted, to, Tracy actually already mentioned, was regarding alternative income. Um, so wherever we're trying to, we're trying to get filming um, jobs in, uh, which there's two coming up in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and there's a couple more inquiries on the go. Um, contract work, which Lee and his team have been very diligent in trying to um, bring in uh, and get some significant funds. We've just had the wedding this weekend, which was successful um, and was a, a decent revenue generator um, for a, you know, a small event. Um, and going forward, um, we want to continue with these things because we want to expand on them. It's other alternative ways of, of generating money for the railway. Uh, that's got to be positive. Um, I think that's it from me for now. I will move over to Gary, um, who I think is on the forum somewhere, uh, for him to do his, and then we'll do the questions afterwards with Mike Moore. Good. Are you, over you, Gary? You, you can hear me, yeah. I'm going to try and share my screen so it might go to Mike or it might go to you, so I'll give it a, I'll give it a whiz if that's okay. <laughs> I should have gone, hey, like Tracy, and been, been all energetic, but I'll get there, I promise. So let's see. Are you seeing a request to um, uh, see my screen, hopefully? So, can everybody see that? Yeah, we can see that. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I won't be able to see you all because I've got two screens. So I'll, I'll be looking vaguely at the screen um, while I do this presentation. So thank you, everybody, for your time. Um, I've got a, a few slides which are themed around uh, take, uh, taking our customer service from good to great. Um, I'll take you on a bit of a journey in terms of um, my time as a, a relatively new volunteer or very new volunteer. And this is really about presenting a, a potential vision to you and a plan which um, you know, we'll need to work as a team to deliver that. 
So in terms of the agenda, then a little bit about me, um, because I've met many of you, but um, some of you I haven't met yet. So I think it'd be a good opportunity to just say hello. Talk a bit about projects um, that we've done and what we're planning. And then the core of the presentation around, you know, why you were all and our, all of our volunteers are so important to helping the railway take our customer service from good to great. And then if I can leave any questions really to the end, purely because logistically um, allow me to sort of focus on the presentation and focus on you when we get to the questions. So a little bit about me, I go without no surprise that I have an interest in railways, which is uh, surprisingly a common, a common trait. Uh, I used to be a regular visitor, or I am now a very regular visitor to the LR, helped by my sister living in, um, in, in Swinton. So I, I've been up in the area very, very regularly. My background's in um, IT, uh, but very much customer centric and asset intensive businesses like um, utilities. Um, I've gone through a lot of life changes the last few years and this is my time to give something back. So uh, joining the board of the, uh, the ELR in, in February, 2021. And if Mike had been completely honest with me back in December of uh, last year, I'm not sure I'd be here, but um, um, I'm glad he wasn't because uh, the railway gets under your skin as everybody knows. Um, simply my role is to support, you know, the ELR is people deliver exceptional customer service and by people, I mean, obviously everybody, volunteers and staff. I spend an inordinate amount of time with Martin uh, and Mark um, and uh, I enjoy every minute, but um, they are making me go grey quite quickly as well. Um, I just wanted to sort of emphasise that I'm a volunteer too. I'm here because I want to be and Lots of people know that, but sometimes when I speak to people, I don't always think they recognise that, like you, I'm giving my time freely for the benefit of the railway and the community as well. And, and, and I generally think people forget that. Um, and if you need me, drop me an email. I, I tend to be quite responsive or very responsive, much to the annoyance of Mark, Martin in particular. So if there's anything that cro crops up or if anything that comes out of today's um, presentation, then be happy to, to help. But as I say, this is more a bit of a preview and a, um, a discussion document than, a, than anything else today. Mark's touched on projects, but I just want to give you an update around um, what we've been doing with our um, ticketing. So uh, in line with the new website, we've um, refreshed the um, 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 key tickets website a little bit just to bring the branding in line with the, the rest of the website and make sure that we we actually have proper images on the, on the uh, Key Tickets website to promote each of our events. Um, in the build-up to, uh, to, to that, we um, spent a lot of time looking at whether Key Tickets were the right partner for us going forwards, particularly, obviously, we've, we've, got, um, we've gone through a massive um, change over the last 18 months, and we're in recovery, as Kath and, and um, Tracy have said. And we spend a reasonable amount of money with key tickets. Um, and so we've really looked at what does that mean in terms of the services that we want from key tickets um, and how they compare to their peers in the industry. And in many elements, such as just normal web ticketing, key are quite, um, um, provide a quite a similar service to, to other um, lower cost options. But with regards to some of the things that they do do, for example, providing telephony service um, to, to our customers, they're peerless. So we've agreed a, a new contract with Key Tickets, which will cover us for the next three years, which um, we're all really pleased about. It's a significant amount of effort really to do that um, review of what the other options were out there and to work with Key to come up with something that was um, perfect for the railway. I'll come back to that in a moment. I, I won't, won't touch too much on the, the website, but um, you know, it was a real team effort with Democracy, Public Relations and Creative Spark. Um, like anything new, it's not perfect. It needs a bit of snagging. And thank you for everyone's feedback and patience. We're getting through that as quickly as we can. But obviously on there, there's really new, and I think quite high energy sections around volunteering and how people can support the railway as well. And on the website, you know, we've got a list as long as everybody's arm on this call in terms of things that we'd like to do better integration, things like raffle, better FAQs so our customers can serve themselves um, much more easily. And um, that will come over the coming, coming months. Um, in terms of back to key tickets, um, and apologies, I've tried to explain what some of these acronyms are, but um, obviously um, in terms of how we sell tickets to our customers, obviously things like the Edmonton tickets are very important for the history and the experience to our passengers but we don't have a consistent way of 
selling tickets across the railway. Um, so the experience that people have purchasing tickets online, which is by far and away the most popular way of buying tickets, isn't, isn't um, replicated uh, across our, um, our stations and, and other outlets. So we're looking to put in place a common platform across um, all of our um, outlets and, and, and ticket offices, really to ensure that we've, uh, um, our volunteers and staff have got um, the easiest way of possible of issuing tickets to our, to our customers, but also to simplify things like cashing up at the end of the day, which I know can be quite arduous. And in CAF's reports, we always seem to be um, catching up in terms of making sure we've got information for, for, for how well we're doing in terms of revenue. Um, around understanding our customer, the website has, uh, has shown us how important it's, it is to understand our customers. And at the start of the website project, we spent a lot of time interviewing a lot of you, but also trying to understand our customers' needs. And we need to keep on doing that. And so capturing information about when are people coming, where are they coming, what are they spending their money on, will help us plan events better, but also think about the implications to our timetables and other aspects as well. Um, as you imagine, with this information, we can think about introducing demand-based um, ticket pricing um, so that on quieter days, we can, we can potentially attract people, look at things like the weather and other events that are going on in the area to actually try and attract people in and increase our revenue. And also a reward screen, uh, scheme might be an option as well. Um, one thing we're eager to do is, is learn from the North Yorkshire Moors Railway, who have been able to put in place gift aid on tickets, um, um, uh, what they call their freedom um, ticket. And so that's something we're looking to, to, to implement. And you know, if we're successful with that, for every ticket sale we have there, you know, it's an extra 25% um, of, of revenue to the railway, which is really, really important. Um, Steve's been involved as well actively around um, how we can support the ELP, ELPS and so there is the potential um, to use the, the system to both support signing up um, new members on the day and making that really easy and issuing their card on the day um, and also um, um, providing support more widely in terms of um, the volunteer database as well and that's something that um, we'll pick up with Steve now that we've got the new contract in place with, with key tickets. Um, going to the, the, the core of this presentation really is, you know, I, I recognize that volunteers are absolutely key to taking our customer service from good to great. And you know, to do that, you know, we all need to work together and, and, and have a common purpose. So that's why I've put together, uh, say, a, a, a draft vision and a set of um, um, principles to, to, to really allow us to think tonight, go away and think about whether this is the right messaging and, and, and thoughts for um uh, and feelings for, for the East Lanks Railway. So three, three elements of this. One is the case, the case for change. Um, I'll come back to that bridge in a moment. Um, next one, obviously, our values and principles, and then how we might put this into practice as well. I suppose the first takeaway is, you know, happy customers are repeat customers. And I think, you know, that sounds really obvious, but... Um, we could spend an awful lot of time and Mark's team can spend an awful lot of time marketing to new people. But if we can um, just focus on our existing customer base, then you know, that will certainly give us a foundation for the future. But also those customers have the potential to convert into volunteers as well, of course. Um, case for change, maybe a sort of suck, teaching you to suck eggs um, slide really, but obviously, Passenger revenue and ourselves were absolutely key to the survival of the, the railway. We've had a real shock over the last 18 months, and you know, we're still going to recover from that, as you can see. I hadn't really appreciated um, um, how much competition we are up against in terms of locally, but also further afield as well. Um, so in parallel to the, um, the website um, work, we've been developing a, 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 the Tracy's uh, leadership um, a, a marketing strategy about how do we attract and retain um, new people but you know people are quite willing to travel an hour or two to, to, to do something that's um, a new experience uh, something fresh etc so we need to keep ourselves relevant and, and make sure that people know not just about the railway but the transport museum and all the events etc that we're doing and it goes without saying our customers expectations as a result are ever increasing um, we can deliver great customer service and I've been on the receiving end and I've witnessed lots and lots, lots of great customer service. 
not just externally to our passengers, but also between departments as well. And, you know, I've seen great conversations and I've seen, you know, um, volunteers and staff across departments really supporting each other. And if people are supported, then clearly it allows us to deliver our best as well. But I have been on the receiving, my, my receiving end myself of what I'd say is not always great customer service. And so we need to learn from, 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 from um, those experiences and, um, and coach our colleagues accordingly. So why straight for customer service? I've talked about some of these, and again, it, the very obvious things, but you know, building trust and loyalty with our customers and businesses is absolutely important. Um, if we deliver great service to our customers, they become great advocates. They tell people about us and they convert their friends and family into new visitors or, or, or new volunteers. It goes without saying, it helps us increase our sales. Um, Delivering great customer service is also a journey about listening to ourselves, listening to our colleagues, but most importantly, listening to our customers about, you know, what we, you know, how good are we actually at doing what we're doing, not being complacent, and really using that to improve what we deliver and how we deliver it. Um, clearly, if other people know that we're a great organisation and that we are, you know, a great place to work, whether we're volunteers or staff then that's going to attract and retain great people to support us um, going forward in the future, building on what Tracy said. I mentioned you know, the increased relationship between departments across the railway. You know, um, if we see something that isn't right on the station or in the ticket office or in ops or on the train, then we have a responsibility not to walk past. We need to take ownership of that and work with our colleagues across departments as one team. Also, it's about obviously stronger partnerships with external stakeholders, whether that's uh, governmental um, stakeholders and obviously the local authorities, but also um, other entities as well. And I guess ultimately, you know, we like to come to, to, to work, to have a better time and to, to enjoy each other's company and get great stuff done. So that's the case of change from my perspective. Um, I'll walk through this briefly, but if I, I'll share these slides after the, uh, the session and, and get you to, to, to take them away and think about it. But I really wanted to put some values together that builds on what I've learned, um, what we've developed as part of the, 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 the website and the personality of the website and, and, and many of the other conversations I had with you. But ultimately, you know, I think we're warm and we provide a warm welcome to everybody. You know, I see great examples of where we're proactive helpful and flexible. Um, we're understanding, you know, I've seen many times where we try and understand and, and have empathy towards our customers in terms of their needs and try and solve their problems and make them have a great day. And obviously with that, we're thoughtful. So having had that contact with our customers, we step back and we make sure that they're always in our forefront, whether we're preparing trains on the day, we're thinking about events, we're getting up in the morning to be a TTI or be on the, on, on the stations or what have you. So we're always thinking about the customer. Um, I guess we also have to accept that we're not perfect, but through taking ownership, you know, we'll work together to resolve issues as well. Um, for me, being challenging, I think Martin and Mark will probably be the first two to say that um, they've been really challenged over the last six months, but we need to challenge ourselves and each other to do better. And as a result of all those things coming together, you know, we can deliver an endearing experience, which you know makes our customers want to come back for more, um, whether that's many times or coming back for bigger and better things, whether it's the diner or other experiences. How does that then translate into principles? Um, and my thoughts on this are, you know, there are four or five really. We, you know, we put the customers at the heart of everything we do. We support and develop our volunteers and staff. We recognize our volunteers and staff, and obviously um, the ELP, um, ELRPS does that. And obviously Mike's announced um, uh, sort of chairman's um, um, side of things as well today, which is great. We listen to our customers and we lead from the front. So how does that tra translate into a plan? Well, in terms of different themes and picking up on those principles, um, I think we have a lot to do um, with our customers. Um, really at the, at the moment, obviously, when we, when we ask our customers on the day, when we check their tickets or we see them on the platform, how we're doing, we're getting good information. We need to take that information, whether it's good or bad, and we need to find a way of, of capturing that. 
There are also very simple ways that we can we can we can capture information from our customers. And one of the things we've got, we've asked key tickets to do is to send out a survey for every uh, after each customer visit, really to understand and give our customers an opportunity to tell us what went well, what can we improve on, and to use that to actually drive um, uh, our improvements going forwards. But also to use that as a means to recognise our people if we've you know if our customers have got examples of great service. We need to keep it simple. Um, I think our new website, I hope you find is, is simpler. It's deliberately simpler to, to make sure that people don't get lost as they navigate around the website so they can find information quickly to help them plan their visit or to book, obviously book tickets. But this is the start of, of, of that. And we need to think about um, all of our customer service processes and try and make those as simple as possible. And there are lots and lots of things we can do to Im improve in this area. Um, most of us know what look great looks like, and you know, we've got a lot that we could bring here. Um, and as a team, we need to take time to learn and share our experiences and knowledge and also challenge each other to give our very best. Um, I like going to, to, to Ramsbottom to see Chandra. Um, Chandra is always full of energy and about a thousand lists of, of things that we should be doing. And we need to turn that energy into something um, really, really active. But that said, Chandra uh, is a great example of someone that you know, believes by those um, values and principles that I've just shown you. And we need to learn from Chandra and others to, to, to do that. Um, one of the questions that we had um, was around external training, rather training, particularly for what, you know, how do we deal with customers? How do we deal with conflict in difficult situations? And that's something that we're looking at. Um, there are um, you know, lots and lots of avenues for that, uh, um, to bring that into the organization. So that could be things like um, um, welcome host code or, alert, or taking training from the Institute of Customer Services, where they have something called first impressions, which is kind of like a sheep dip for, for trainees, um, for, for training, whether it's um, people that have been um, um, longstanding as a volunteer or staff or who are new to the railway, it's equally applicable. Um, around training as well, you know, we need to, to em emphasize customer services as part of um, um, things like our inductions and as part of um, reviews and regular feedback to our colleagues and obviously incorporate that into competencies as well. Um, Tracy introduced me to the SMILE team, which I think was something that she and Mike were talking um, um, to the volunteer group on, on Monday. And again, that's a great way of just in, in embodying um, what we're trying to get across really in terms of customer service, which is if we're warm and welcoming to our customers, um, you know, that passion is, um, is, 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 is really con contagious and it can apply to us, you know, we can apply it to our colleagues, but also to ourselves as well. And it emphasizes very simply the importance of great customer service. So Mike's talking about recognizing our people, but you know, we can take each other for granted you know, quite simply. And every time I see someone just say thank you and take a time to pull a colleague to one side and say, you know what, that was really, really great. That's really warming and heartening. And obviously the annual award ceremony. Um, and if we bring all this together, I suppose ultimately we're inspiring. Um, you know, we'll be seen by our people and our peers as leading the way. So people want to come to us and, and want to volunteer, but also outside of the railway, um, you know, you know, we, could, we could look to third party accreditations. Obviously, um, I remember um, when David and Margaret and Steve were giving my induction a few months ago, um, um, you know, it's very obvious that you know, we've got lots and lots of accreditations and we're really recognized for great things in many, many areas uh, like customer services to be um, one thing that we're remembered for by people, whether they're visiting for the first time or whether they're um, part of Visit, Visit England or the HRA or, or elsewhere as well. So there's lots and lots and lots for us to do. Um, I'm encouraged by the progress we made in the last six months. Um, and that's really down to the support I've had from a number of you and obviously Tracy's team as well. I look forward to cracking on and getting some of these things done. Any Thank questions? You much, Gary. Thank you. Um, we have a, a question which I, I have not been told what it is from Stephen Holt. If, if he could unmute himself and put your question to Gary, Stephen, wherever you are. Yes, are. I can do. Yeah, um, Gary, thank you very much for that presentation. Um, obviously, Mark Hill has already alluded to the fact that we have a, a Thomas event this weekend. It's going to be in a different format. Yeah. But I'm sure you know, Gary, that um, 
for many, many years, the railway has tried to encourage local residents to sign up for a residence permit, mm -hmm. which gives them 70% off the fares. Now, at one time it was £22 for three years, now it's £22, I think, for two years. Mm -hmm. Now, it, um, this, this weekend, we're not going to be able to use it. And I know in the past when I've been speaking to some residents, you know, there's been another occasion where they've not been able to use it because of an event. And they're asking the question, what's the point of having the residence permit if you can't use it? Because some of them like to get on the train, say, at Ramsbottom or Rottenstall, come into Bury. They use it mainly commercially. I know we're not a commercial railway, but that's what they like to use it for, to come and shop. And, or, but also they like to use it for a, a leisure activity. So do you think we're going to upset them even more? Because we used to do a residence weekend here, which I used to arrange in March, to try and get new people on board to sign up and uh, be uh, part of the residence uh, fraternity. Yeah. Um, I'll try and answer the two or three questions from my perspective. Um, I guess I have the naivety of being here six months with a slightly different perspective. So um, I guess from a, Tom, from a Thomas events perspective, I think, you know, simplistically, that's an absolutely great opportunity to attract new people and to maximise the revenue to, to the railway. So I guess we need to ask ourselves is is that what we're trying to do or you know do, within that is the scope to have um some capacity to uh, ensure that we've got room to allow residents that want to buy on the day um to to, to travel so i guess that's a that's a a conversation that um we need to have you know tracy mark marty and i need to have um so I, I, Stephen, I guess that's a really difficult one because you, 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 you've got two competing priorities there. Um, I, I guess partly we, we solve it around the terms and conditions in terms of making sure that when residents buy into the, um, the, in, into the pass, that they know, you know what they're getting and that they understand why they may not be able to come on put, um, certain days. So I think partly, you know, maybe the challenge we've got for this weekend is you know, we need to make sure in the future we're better at helping people understand the challenges that we have and why it may not always be um, possible for us to accommodate them on a particular day. I guess we also have a question around, are we in competition with buses or are we, you know, a, 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 another trains or are we, are, we, um, are we there to provide an experience? And I think that's a big, that's a big question for us as well. Um, so, yeah. If it sounds like I'm sitting on the fence, I'm not. I just I can see it from both perspectives, and the two are very difficult to reconcile. Stephen, you're absolutely right. I'll just finish off and say this, Gary. At one time, we used to allow the residents to travel on Thomas, not for the event, but just on the service trains, because in the winter months we rely on some of their contra financial contributions. Because in the winter, the hospitality trade obviously goes down a little bit, apart from Halloween and Santa's. So I think, you know, we, nobody wants to push them away. But yeah, you're right. right. I think we need to give them a better explanation. But thank you for your reply. That's OK. I uh, just pick it. I just jot, I just jotted two words down and residence weekend. And I think, you know, um, um, I, I, yeah, we'll take that offline, Stephen. I'll ping you though. It'd be great to, to learn more about how they used to work. Okay. And that sounds like a really, really good idea because that reinforces you know, our relationship with the community. It brings people together. You know, it allows us to, 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 to build goodwill. It allows them to remind people to stop chucking their stuff over fences as well, I guess. So that would exactly. be, um, yeah. be quite, yeah, yeah. So I think we should take that forward. Thank you very much for your response. Thank you. Thank you, right. Thank you, Stephen. Um, I want to move on now to the few questions we have left. Most of the questions we received have actually already been answered during the various commentaries. Um, one from Brian Mather, who works at Ramsbottom. It concerns the Thomas train this coming weekend. Uh, most of the people on board will be looking to see Thomas close up and take photographs. Uh, the, the journey as we've got it at the moment is it leaves platform three, goes to Ramsbottom and virtually comes straight back. And Brian is quite concerned with the length of the train, which has now got seven, seven carriages uh, and two engines whereabouts Thomas will be stopping in platform three to allow a maximum number of people to get um, photographs of it. Uh, and I think Rory may have some explanation of where the stopping is planned. Where are you, Rory? Here. Yep. Oh, yep. 
Uh, well, well, partly with planning, you see, the um, event in which aside originally we had 15 minutes at Ramsbotham, um, but then they, we, we, we had an instruction that said, well, what do people actually do when they get to Ramsbottom? 15 minutes. Are they going to get off? And if they get off, they're going to start delaying the train. So it's decided that the train would come straight back, virtually, um, unless it needed to take water. Um, you know, so that was the decision. So if, obviously, if it's going to take water, it will stop water, the water to, the water tower. The horse doesn't get to that, because uh, it might need to take water. And we have put the caveat in if it needs to take water, it needs to take water. Now, one of the things I would speak to Lorna today is to hopefully make announcements saying that this train will be coming straight back. Um, this is to give us more time at um, Bury to have an interaction with Troublesome Brook. Otherwise, there's going to be a bit of a, you know, in, out, see you, buy, get lost. And uh, but we don't want that. We want people to spend the time, come in, you know, have a ride on Thomas, to see the Troublesome Truck or that. Again, it goes back to my point. We're not going to exclude Ram's Bottom or Rockstall or here, whether it's just on this occasion, we have to do it this way because it's a new format. Um, originally, like I said, they had 15 minutes, but now we're going to have to have, you know, it's just virtually straight back uh, so we can give that extra time at Ramsworth to give everyone, um, you know, a, a fuller well, appreciation. But I know it doesn't appeal to a lot of people at Ramsworth, it doesn't probably appeal to people at Rockstall, but it's on this occasion, you know, that's what the plan's been agreed. Um, the other thing is when it comes back into Derry um, on platform three, because it's a long train, it'll have to go beyond the gantry because we want to see Thomas on the platform. We don't want it hang, or hanging off the platform so people can't see it. We want people to actually take a horse draft. But I, obviously I've got to take into consideration that they also have a train going to Rotterdam, which will be sitting in the through side. It needs to come into platform four. So all these things are in consideration. Stephen. Stephen Holt, can you close your mic, please? Sorry about this, Roy. Thank you. Anyway, well, that's the explanation. You know, so it's a, it's a, you know, decision we made with a combination between commercial operation, you know, and um, on this occasion, I think that's the best plan we can come up with. You know, not ideal, you know, but uh, it realistically, with the timetable we had, we let people off at Amherst Bottom. I think the event would start running late and we'd end up, you know, just until seven o'clock at night. Um, I don't want. And I'm still not clear, Rory. Is Thomas going to be parked in a position in Platform 3 where people can get photographs? Yes. It's, it's, so it's not on the ramp. Yeah, that's that's the important thing. Uh, when it comes back, we'll pull the answer signal off so it can go beyond. It should be keep and tailed. get photographs. But on, a, on a, some occasion, might not be back up once people got photographs, like the um, service train, which only goes three times a day. Wrong, so but I think on a couple of occasions, we don't we need to do that. Okay, thanks, Rory. Um, Clarifies on there. My question wasn't so much about just what goes on at Ram's Bottom. It was a concern that there should be opportunities for people to pause in front of Thomas. And based on what Rory said, that seems to be the case. So thank you. Thanks, Brian. Yep. Um, Tega Farrow put in two questions. One, I think, has probably already been connect, uh, answered, considering the financial state of the railway. The second question, uh, I'm not sure, probably Tracy. Uh, now that all COVID-19 restrictions have been lifted from the government, is it OK to reopen the sleeper carriage for volunteer use once again? Somebody, please. Oh, yeah. Mike, I'll, I'll just come in on that. Oh, right, Lee. Yes, thanks, Lee. Yeah. Um, the sleeper carriage is open and can be used. Uh, I just need to clarify with Lois Hatton, or Lois Levers, should I say, um, whether she's still taking bookings for the volunteers that we uh, use it, because that's how it used to work pre-COVID, so, um, so they can sort out keeps for access, etc. Right. Uh, thanks, Lee. So, thank you, Lee. Yeah, that's that's sort sort of take her out, right? Um, Ray Fru's hands question has been answered. I think the the final one for the evening is from Nigel Barnes. Uh, I'll read it out. It is a, a little bit longer, better if I read it. I think 
In the past, a chap who's been flailing, that's cutting grass or weeds, for most of his adult life, got so frustrated at the state of the grass verge, he started the flail and just got stuck in. But now, because of new rules, people hiding behind ORR, etc., and the seeming inability to get competent people signed off, the most simple of jobs aren't getting done. Well, I brought this up recently. Predictable excuses were offered. The best one being that because of data protection law, the person who is tasked with signing people up doesn't know who has capabilities in what. Can we have a comment about how new rules are stopping the job getting done? How many willing members have to break the rules? Or as so many are choosing to do, leave the ELR not to return? I'm more than happy to take this question. And I would actually like to um, share with you, there's loads and loads of stuff that we could do 20 years ago, like sit in my size eight jeans that I can't do now. And one of those things is um, certainly my family expect for, from me. As an organisation, we expect more from each other and we've got a duty of care. And that is, I can get my chainsaw out and chop the trees out in my garden, but I can't bring that piece of equipment onto the railway and use it because that accident, if you have an accident, belongs to us. And this is where we are. Um, we want to look after everybody. So... The challenge is, this is law, not just me being awkward. If we're on our, our um, footprint, if you're on our property and you're using equipment, you have to be competent to use that equipment. That's as simple as it gets. There is no hiding behind anything. There is no excuses. It's just your family expect you to come home every day and... I expect everybody to go on without injury. So that is the least that we can expect from each other. So it's just taking that care and realising what you could do 20, 30, 40 years ago, you can't actually do now. And it's for all the right reasons that we don't allow it to be happen. Does that answer your question, Nigel? I can't see Nigel on my screen. I think he is here somewhere. Not coming up. It's a very good point that he raises because it is so easy to understand and, and feel like, yeah, it's so simple and it's not getting done. Well, we're not making the process hard. We're just doing the process properly. So, it, I mean, a classic example is when I worked in Wales, the council decided they weren't going to cut the grass anymore because they were having a council cut. Walking along the seafront one morning, there was a bloke strimming in his sandals because the community had taken over that job, but they hadn't realised the implication of what they were doing could actually injure themselves as well as drop everybody else into a state where emergency services were out. Whose accident is it? It's just that care for each other. Uh, OK, you've given the reason why we must be safe. Fair enough. Um... I suppose the next question or next part of the question is why the delay? Uh, it's not a good excuse to say data protection prevents us from signing people off to do rudimentary skills. There's absolutely oh, nothing to do with data protection about this. So I don't know where that's come from. I, I, look, if somebody wants to go forward, get certified, get a course. I've done a, a, a spray certification course independently. <coughs> I can hand that over. It goes into our processing system and I can do that, that work for the railway. You can do it independently or you can get put on a course with us. So it, it's not difficult. Okay. Right. Well, it appears to be because there's a lot of people mourning that they can't get signed off. And, and, and it was it was the director of the railway who said it was because of data protection. Well, that ain't the they case at had, all. They didn't, they, didn't, they didn't know who had the relevant skills to get them quickly signed off and that they would all have to go on a training exercise, <clears throat> which is kind of, um, well, there we are, spending more money we don't have, sending everybody on training courses. I don't Richard, know what Jeff or Andy, you. you've got your hands up. Yeah, can I, can I just come in a, just a bit about the ORR, really? Uh, we don't actually hide uh, or use the ORR as an excuse. We, we actually work well with the ORR. 
Um, I, I speak to them regular, mm. and I'm quite happy to report to the OR uh, any incidents that we have that needs to be reported. So we don't hide mm. anything from the OR. We work with them, and we don't use that as a threat. Uh, if we see anything being done wrong and it's reportable to OR, we do that, uh, and they work with us to make sure that we get our systems in, in place. So we have a very good working mm. relationship with the OR, and I think by I don't know who's who's, who's hiding behind the OR or threatening people about the OR. That's not right. We have a good working relationship. In fact, they're coming to the East Lanks Railway to do a course in the uh, museum, so we do work well with them. And I will take any incidents that should be reported to the OR because that's 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 what we need to do. And they they give us advice, and we listen to that advice. Thanks, Jeff. I think one thing that we do need to clarify is the fact that the ORR expects, the expectation, and it's not a hard one to believe, is that we run an operation that is fit for 2021 with heritage stuff. So we look heritage, we are heritage, we believe in heritage, but we've got standards that are 2021. That's what they expect, and they'll tell that quite openly to anybody. Thanks, Tracy. Um, Andy Hardman wants to make a comment. Andy? Yeah, hi, Mike. Uh, yeah, it's about, Tracy knows about this, it's about weed killing. Uh, Tracy and I walked the Barron Street Yard uh, a couple of weeks ago, and the weeds, Budlier and everything else is taking over. We've probably lost about 10% of our, or 15% of our <clears throat> yard due to all this. Uh, I had to dig some uh, posts out from the west side of the bank uh, with a machine the other week and I mean the, you know, the, the weeds are like literally 10 foot high and it's becoming a safety issue. We really need to sort the weed killing out because it, it's you know if we leave it any longer you know we're just losing so much of our surface area it's bloody unbelievable and also it's becoming uh, a safety hazard. Uh, weed killing is not going to deal with the stuff that's 10 foot high now. You need something a bit more industrial than weed killer on that. Well, right. Let's, let's, right. Give me, give me an answer. So, the north, some the north end of the line is full of weeds at all. Please don't just interrupt, please, folks. Um, Richard uh, Moore's got his hand up, please. Richard, you're on mute. That's yes. Yeah. No, I'm not now on mute. Um, yes. Um, Thank you. I can answer one or two of the direct questions, um, but I think here we're, we're all being very polite with each other and there's a lot to be gained from politeness and um, uh, respect for each other. But less so valuable is skirting around the issue. And going to um, Nigel's, the, the nub of Nigel's uh, questions, which uh, he's representing a lot of people here. He's not representing a lot of people on this forum, but he's representing a lot of people. Um, there is the feeling that a lot of these restrictions are being imposed by them up there. My answer to that always is there is no them and us. There's only us. There, there's no separate organization imposing these um, restrictions. Tracy was quite right that what we did 20 years ago, or even 40 years ago, I remember, I was there. And people had accidents and just went home and nursed their injuries. And the public and our members expect something different these days. You can't do that anymore. And whilst perhaps Nigel and I might just have... A, 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 an, an inclination to just go home and nurse our wounds. Uh, most people haven't. And that's not the way it's done these days. We need to investigate the very slightest accidents so that we know what's going on. Because 20 years ago, and I don't think that's quite far enough, but 40 years ago, 30, 30 years ago, no, the organisation as a whole, that's us as a whole, didn't know what was going on. We had accidents and kept quiet. We, we, we strimmed the grass bank on the top of the cliff wearing sandals or the railway equivalent of that on a regular basis. And 
many people now don't understand why we've got to have all these restrictions and why we've got to spend money, which I agree, we, we can barely afford on training courses. Well, the answer is, if you think that aspect of safety is costing a lot, try having an accident. Try having an accident and see how that much that costs. I mean, we had a simple accident about two years ago, didn't we? Um, where a trolley ran away. And I'm not going back to the trolley incident, but just as an example, do you know how much that cost? I think it probably cost maybe £10,000 in management time just to try to answer all the questions from the REIB. Oh, they didn't exist 20 years ago. They only started 15 years ago. And why? Because all of us on the railway, on all the railways, thought enough is enough. We can't keep having these accidents and not getting really to the bottom of it. Yes, for many years, we'd, we'd got to the bottom of uh, about as far as who we can blame. Yeah, as far as who we can blame. And, and it didn't go really much further. Um, and things are different now. And, and it's accidents that made things different. Luckily, uh, or fortunately, or through good management and good intention, it wasn't accidents all on the East Lanks Railway. We are actually quite good. We always have been good, but we've got all these things now to cope with. And it's not being imposed. An, an example that um, uh, Nigel gave me this afternoon when I spoke to him is, is flashing uh, modern flashing uh, LED tail lamps on the backs of trains. Why has that been imposed? And there were a number of people up there who were blamed for this. But it isn't actually up there. Up there want something that looks like a traditional tail lamp because we are committed to heritage. We're committed to preservation. We're committed to making something that looks something in the first half of the 20th century or up to 1960 plonk or whatever. We're committed to that. Otherwise, we wouldn't be bloody here. So don't blame everybody for not doing everything that can be done. If anybody's got any sort of preconception that things are being imposed, can you please come and talk to us? Come and talk to me. When am I not on the railway? It's a, well, definitely the minority of the time, even including sleeping time sometimes. I just got home today, just in time, to queue up to get into this forum, right? That's from nine o'clock ish this morning. And I like that all the time. I had a day off last Sunday. The sky fell in just because I wasn't here, right? So for heaven's sake, if people have got whinges and moans, yes, good. That means you're committed. That means you care. So please come and talk. Come and talk to me. Tracy is on the railway just about every day at the moment. Oh, she's going to grow dahlias in September. But apart from that, she's on the railway every flipping day. Jeff Armstrong's on the railway every day. And now they get paid. Does that make them different? They don't get paid for the hours they put in. They don't get paid for the value they put in. Neither do I. I don't get paid for the value I put in. Neither does, neither does Nigel. Neither does any of the other speakers. Um, uh, Mr. Holt, he doesn't get paid for the value he puts in. Um, Mr. Mather, he doesn't get paid for the value he puts in. We're all in this together, you know. Oh, well, that sounds like a politician, doesn't it? Forget I said that, that's rubbish. But we are all trying the same thing. And if it doesn't seem to go your way at the same speed that you think it should do, can you please come and talk to me? Because... I'll tell you if, if it's a misconception, but if you're right, I'll agree with you, you're right. And we'll pry together to get something done. But can we please just... Thank, thanks, Richard. Thinking we're back, we're, we're, not, we're not us and them. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Michael. Thank you very much. That was Winston Churchill. I've got five minutes left and there are two more questions that have popped up. Um, and they're going to have to make it very brief, folks, please, if Stephen Holt knows how to be brief. Um, Stephen, you want to ask a question about weekly communication? Yes, all it was. Uh, we used to get a, a weekly bulletin, which was very informative. 
about what was going on, what's coming on, etc. And that stopped all of a sudden with no explanation. I wonder why. I think the top and bottom of it is um, this was a, a, a task, a management team task that we agreed to do. Lee took on the mantle and we were to feed Lee with the information. And I think the job outgrew what we were required to do. So Lee could only do on what we could feed him. And really, this is something that we need to get sorted out. And I think Hops has got a new, if I'm correct, Rory, a news page that we were looking at putting the news and information on there on a, a weekly basis so it doesn't become Lee's chore because, I mean, he did a fantastic job, made it really interesting and exciting, but he's also got other things to do. But it was a, a good piece of communication, information, and I think we'll go on to using that more often. Rory? Yes, the new version of Hops has got a, a news item. The old version has, but it's not as good. But the new version will be rolling out in a few weeks, and you'll be able to, uh, and it can be formatted as well. So you can have on the line, bold, uh, not just main text. Oh, formatting. New toys. Oh, we'll be able to roll that out. And your emails as well. You'll be able to format an emails as well. Because uh, I know everyone hates emails, even though it's Thanks. giving information. Thanks, Rory. I'm, I'm keen to move on. Um, and Bob Howarth has got another question about residence path permits. Yeah, good evening. Um, can I just go back? I've listened to everything very carefully this evening, and I've listened to three people discussing residence permit holders for Thomas Weekend. Now that we're running an extra train right up to Rottenstall, and now we're running DMUs from Haywood, why can't we have a look again, please, at residents using their permit just to do a DMU and the other train, which is what we used to do in all those years ago. They could still travel on a Thomas Day, but obviously they couldn't come back with a face painted or whatever. They couldn't participate in the Thomas events. But I think we're going to upset a lot of people. And briefly, just very briefly, historically, I was always told they had an obligation for residents to support local people and whatever. We need to keep that in mind. And historically, I understood that we had to provide these facilities for VAT or some other tax reason. But at least let's just have a little look at it and see if, if we only sell another 20 tickets at two quid each or eight quid each, that's another 20, 20 people. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Um, Nobody's going to come back on that one, I hope. Uh, Richard's still got his hand up. Is that for another point, Richard? No. James? No, I'm Bottom going to take it down. Sorry. All right. James Bottomley, I think it is. James B. You want to say something, James? Hello, Mike. Yeah, it was just uh, just two questions. One was, um, is there an update on the what we talked about on the last Zoom? Um, it was about the contactless donations um, sort of tap and donate at each station is is that anywhere nearer to coming coming to you know some sort of fruition we've certainly looked at it james i think kat's got some more details i think it made a cringe when she found out how much it was all right <laughs> yeah we have um we we have some qr codes that are currently um uh, put up around the station but they're not working at the moment for one thing or another um, the purchase of the actual um, stands that we wanted um, were dear, but we were willing to invest in it. However, now that we have um, trialled this uh, QR code and we can see the amount of people trying to donate, uh, it wouldn't be viable to, to purchase these stands. Um, um, uh, I think that's, you know, we want to pursue the contact of contactless donation, absolutely. Um, I think the QR code is the way to go for now. In addition to that, the, we couldn't um, actually order the uh, stand for a long, long time because um, all businesses wanted them, so they're out of stock till the end of the year. Um, but it is something we want to continue with as far as contactless donations go. Can I just, um, um, Bob just mentioned about um, the VAT element on Thomas. We, last year or the beginning of this year, we um, clarified with HMRC that we no longer need to have um, passengers on uh, the Thomas and the Santa sets uh, to be able to um make it uh okay with those guys as far as um VAT goes. So just so you know. 
Thanks, Kath. It is pre well, it's 40 seconds past 8.30. And uh, I did say we were the guillotine. I have no other questions I'm aware of. So, so I'm sorry, Mike. The second question was it was on, on the back of Andy Arden's comment about weed killing. Um, the north end of the line is, is you can hardly see much of the ballast in certain places. Is, is weed killing happening at some point up the north end of the line? And, and it was just a query, really. Um, we seem to have felled a lot of trees, um, which has sort of lost the wooded appeal of that section, you know, around Stubbins, Irwell Vale. We're just wondering what the reason was for felling a massive load of trees where you can see some industrial units now and it's no longer our nice little wooded passage. Um, I, I can say that one of the, the, the guys who works in the civil engineering department is a qualified um, weed killing spray operative or whatever the title is, and has been doing some work with that again on Monday on the station at Berry, and he has done Hayward, I think he's done Rottenstall, uh, but it does take two or three weeks for the weeds to die away, so there may be some time before they, they finally vanish. Um, I don't want to prolong this any further. If there's any more comments about weed killing, I'm sure we'll get them out to you one way or another. Uh, it's just up to me now to say thank you, everybody, for attending tonight. Thank you to all the speakers and the people who put the questions. Um, probably another couple of months before we have another open forum, unless something special comes up. But thank you very much for attending. If you want to volunteer for Thomas this weekend, please get in touch. It's very important that we have staff on duty as much as we can, and we're very short at the moment. Thank you very much and good night to everybody. Thank you, Nick. Night. Good night. <laughs> good night, Colin. <laughs> <laughs>